good. So now it's, yeah, it says recording now. Excellent. Super. So let's get started. Okay. So um, this is our 13th webinar um, at Nordic Labs and DNA Life. And um, today we have uh, Dr. Uh, Sherwoods, as I call them, but um, Michelle and Mark with us, and um, they're going to talk about genetics. So that's really exciting. I'm Anne Catherine. I'm the co-founder of Nordic Laboratories and DNA Life, where we are, well, a group of companies that is dedicated to change healthcare and dedicated to uh, inspire practitioners to work with functional medicine and personalized medicine. And remember, all you people here, you have your login to our portal where you can uh, order lab tests and supplements for yourself and your patients and the people that you care for and so on. So we are recording um, and we will send out the recording as soon as we can. Um, and um, also we will send out a link because some of you, when you have listened to uh, Mark and Michelle, you will um, probably want to have more. This is like an appetite that they're gonna, they're gonna create an appetite, I would say, and hopefully you get so hungry that you wanna spend more time with it. Or we can say it's a, it's a date as well, and you might want to date more, kind of. You can choose how you what you like. But anyway, we are, we are offering a, a DNA Life certification training on, uh, in September 11th to 13th. Um, and the price is 395 US dollars. And in that price, you don't only get the uh, course, you also get six nutrigenomic tests from DNA Life. Um, and you can do them on yourself. So when you go through the training with uh, the Sherwoods, you can then look at your own results and it just makes it really exciting to work that way and learn that way. Then uh, the next webinar is going to be on the 27th uh, of August, where I have uh, Sebastian Brandhorst. Uh, he's a PhD and research assistant at um, uh, Southern California University. And he's going to talk uh, in details in regards to research behind the fasting mimicking diet. Some of you attended uh, the talk I did on Prolon um, on fasting mimicking diet, and he's going to give you a lot more, also moving into some of the... Um, autoimmune conditions in relation to fasting mimicking diet. So, Michelle, Mark, I met you first time in October 2016 and, mm -hmm. I, and you were walking down the corridor and I was looking at these and they were so strong. They had so big muscles and they just looked so happy and I thought, I hope they come and join me at my booth. So I kind of like uh, asked them to come over and see what we had and they... Um, I showed them the DNA Life uh, products that we have, the, the, the different DNA tests that we offer. Um, and a relationship started then and there. Uh, Mark and Michelle have been using thousands of DNA tests on their patients since then. So they have amazing clinical experience with the test. And they started very quickly after that to uh, do the DNA Life uh, certification for doctors and practitioners. We've been doing a lot live. That was basically what we did to begin with, but because things changed in the world, we had to do it online instead. Um, and the next one, remember, is in September, so if you want to join us. But it is, it is a journey and a relationship that I'm very, very happy of having. Uh, and I see that we have an amazing future to, together, uh, together with all you out there, together apart. <laughs> um, and you will probably notice now already um, how knowledgeable they are they're very very perfect perfectionistic in their way of presenting and they're very much hands-on so that you get like a clinical uh view into what you sh should do with uh with a dna result so mm -hmm. that's uh that's that's what i will say now because i'm gonna pass on the screen to these amazing two people and then I will be sitting on the side. If there's any questions, I will try and answer them. And if I can see there's patterns and questions or whatever, then I will take a note of them and then I'll bring them up in the end uh, for the Q&A session. So you two lovely people, I will pass on the, uh, the stage to you and um, yeah, hit the road.
Well, thank you, Anne Catherine. It's a pleasure to be here with you uh, wherever you are. I've seen some um, some of our friends on there from around the world, and so I know we can't be with you right now in person, but we're going to do what we do. We're going to give you right now a big old virtual hug, right? So there you go, virtual hug to everyone. So we're grateful to be here. Um, we have a power-packed uh, presentation uh, for you today. It's going to be rapid fire, and um, a lot of little twists in here that we didn't include in the uh, course because, as Ann Catherine said, um, even today, just a few minutes ago, we swabbed uh, two or three people back there uh, getting their DNA results to do this just today. So it's very much part of what we do. We do see people here in clinical practice um, right here where we are in Oklahoma in uh, the United States and Tul city of Tulsa. So uh, let's dive in, shall we? Wanna let's do it. No, we're just excited to be here to spread the wellness life across the globe. So here we go. I'm going to share the screen right now and we will uh, diminish um, our video for a moment just because um, uh, you, you need to be looking at that, not us, we'll say. So we'll come back to that in a minute. But um, we'll dive in right now to our presentation as, as a whole. So uh, just to welcome everyone, we're going to talk today about uh, this idea of oxidative stress and methylation. And we're going to really go into those two sections and you know, which do you treat first? How do you treat this stuff? And what are you doing? What are you looking for with genetics? It's very, very important to understand. Now, when we look at this, it's important to really uh, get the idea that um, the effect of nutrition on health and disease can't be understood without a deep understanding of how nutrients act at a molecular level. So this inter-individual variability in response to dietary intervention, if you will, is well-documented occurrence in research and practice. And besides a number of factors such as age and gender and the influence of genetics, it's becoming increasingly important uh, for considerations. And clearly, as you see in this graphic, one side, one size does not and cannot fit all. When we take an optimal environment, optimal gene expression, we get the optimal phenotype. Your health is a result of the interplay between your genes and lifestyle factors. By adjusting your diet and lifestyle, quote unquote, the environment, you can give great impact to how your genes work and compensate for areas where your genes are not functioning optimally. So a way that we explain this to patients and our community is this, uh, you know, it's kind of a funny little picture of those damn genes, but I want you to know how to communicate this to people so they can see the value. And if you can see on the screen, my mouse, you can see this downstream flow from the, the dam. So all this upstream stuff that we see here comes in and interacts with this dam. The dam has a conversation. There's an interaction right here. And the dam determines how much to let out to control the flow down here. Flooding down here is synonymous or analogous with disease processes. And as we know, we're not anti-medication, but if the water comes up, we may throw a sandbag at that, meaning a pill. But it did not account for what happened up here. So the genes are right here in the dam. This is how you, as the individual person, interact with the environmental upstream inputs. So we got all these things that we control up here. Not all, of course, but a good amount of them. These are these lifestyle factors. So the lifestyle, environmental interaction with the genes determines predictably the ability to control the flow. What are we talking about? We're talking about disease resilience and disease avoidance. So we talk about nutritional genomics, nutrigenetics, and how they are the future of true healthcare. We want to understand that nutritional genomics is the science studying the relationship between the human genome, nutrition, environment, and health. As we begin this, a couple of things with terminology, and I know this is going to be a review for many of you, but for some of you it might not be. When you see at the top there, you see wild types. So let's just look at the, you know, we're getting uh, one set of chromosomes from mom, one from dad, but as they sort of run in tandem together, on each side are these genetic strands that can be the same, or you could have one different than the other, or you could have, again, the same. What does this mean? Wild type, 
is known as the most common pair, the most common pair. So if we have the most common and the most common, it is said to be wild type. If we have the most common and we have an uncommon variable, meaning we're talking about single nucleotide polymorphisms, that's called hetero, meaning different zygote. If we have a pair of the most unusual in these single nucleotide polymorphisms, it would be a homozygote. This is neither advantageous or disadvantageous. It just depends based upon the situation. And we're gonna go over some of these particular single nucleotide polymorphisms today in the oxidative stress section, as well as in methylation. And we're gonna tie them together in a really unique way. This next slide will tell you how we're gonna tie these in together. Now, we cover oxidative stress first because in, the, um, uh, in a perfect world, we have adequate dietary antioxidant coverage, which is going to repair minor re reactive oxygen species. So therefore, you end up with minor DNA damage and you end up with normalization of DNA methylation. However, the opposite is true if we are in this thing called a toxic environment from exotoxins, endotoxins, and excessive toxic load, which leads to greater reactive oxygen species, greater DNA damage, and then we end up with hypomethylation of DNA for defense. So let's just kind of break this down real simple. If an oxidant comes in, it's going to create the reactive oxygen species. Now, if you got a little bit of that, that's good, and methylation can catch up and keep up with that. But if you have too much of that, as Dr. Michelle stated, that can be a negative, resulting in the lowered ability to repair DNA. Therefore, we're talking about hypomethylation. So really, when you look at this, it is wisdom to examine and begin to manage, and even if you want to use the word treat, the antioxidant or oxidative stress section first. So these are the three names that are actually in the reports that you will see in the antioxidant status. Free radicals are a normal byproduct of the body's energy generating biochemical processes. They're highly reactive with other molecules and can damage DNA, proteins, and cell membranes. The balance between oxidation and antioxidation is believed to be critical in maintaining healthy biological systems. Dietary antioxidants such as vitamin C, vitamin E, selenium, carotenoids, polyphenols, we know are free radical scavengers that interact with free radicals to ensure that it's no longer a reactive molecule and can play an essential role in many antioxidant mechanisms in our health. However, the major role in antioxidant defense is fulfilled by our body's own antioxidant enzymes that we're getting ready to uncover. So check this out. This is a pathway I really want you to catch. So I'm gonna use my mouse to sort of navigate around here. So when oxygen comes into the body, it is used to accomplish, among other things, the electron transport system, creation of NADPH oxidase, the peroxisomes, and even your CYP450 enzyme system, so detoxification. So oxygen plus nutrients is required to accomplish these particular functions, but as a byproduct of normal functioning of the body, a byproduct, we're going to get the first free radical created, superoxide. Now, when superoxide is created, again, that's normal. And if the superoxide is created, it's going to activate this enzyme, superoxide dismutase, which we'll talk about in the panel in just a moment. Superoxide is then converted to hydrogen peroxide. Again, normal function of here means this converts to this. Now, hydrogen peroxide is then converted by catalase and glutathione peroxidase to water and oxygen or water. However, if superoxide is not converted properly to hydrogen peroxide because of maybe low functioning SOD, let's talk about that just for a second. SOD 
from a genetic standpoint, the wild type, believe it or not, is lower functioning. That does not mean it doesn't function. It just means it is lower function. So these enzymes that have real specific and important duties within our oxidative stress pathway, they could be low functioning. But think about this from another standpoint. What about the cofactors or the gasoline that makes this work? We'll talk about the cofactors that makes this work. So even if the enzyme is low functioning, but it has enough cofactors, it will work. On the other side, if it's fully functional, but has no cofactors or low cofactor availability, it might not work. If these superoxide catalase and glutathione peroxidase do not operate correctly, superoxide then, with the help of excess nitric oxide, which we'll talk about in just a moment, can combine to make peroxynitrite. This can create damage, lipid peroxidation, protein nitration. Now, it can also superoxide be converted to hydroxyl radical, as well as excess hydrogen peroxide. Again, if catalase and glutathione peroxidase are not functioning well. Hydroxyl radical has zero good purpose. Peroxynitrite has at least some purpose, though limited, but hydroxyl radical has zero. But watch this, if we have enough hydrogen, which we'll talk about how to get that in the system in just a moment, hydroxyl radical can be converted back to H2O, which is water. All of that said, many things can go wrong with this enzyme, this enzyme, this enzyme, or this enzyme, creating an excess amount of free radicals, which will absolutely disturb and impair the methylation function, which we'll tie those in in just a moment. So here you can see oxidative stress, that oxygen radical can be uh, upregulated by a sedentary lifestyle, by smoking, uh, an unbalanced, or we call it here in America, standard American diet. Cellular respiration can do it. Your cells are respiring as we're sitting here talking, and that can create it, as well as other environmental factors. And as we said before, you see that oxygen-free radical converted by SOD, hydrogen peroxide, and then further broken down to the left of the slide by catalase to water and oxygen, or by glutathione peroxidase back to water itself. Let's dive in a little bit deeper to just glutathione peroxidase, and let's talk about how it works. You know, when we talk about this redox status, we're talking about oxidation reduction. The body has a self-correction, so in this idea of using, in this case, glutathione peroxidase, we can see how it's recycled and how some of these cofactors go to work. So let's go from right over here to left over here, where the processes of oxidation and reduction occur simultaneously and cannot happen independently of one another. So the oxidation alone and the reduction alone are each called a half reaction because two half reactions always occur together to form a whole reaction. So when writing these half reactions, the gained and lost electrons are typically included explicitly in order that the half reaction be balanced with respect to the electron charge. So oxidation is the loss of electrons, or better said, or other ways said, an increase in oxidation state by a molecule, an atom, or an ion. Reduction, again, is the gain of the electron. So when we get these free radicals that are created, you can see how glutathione peroxidase, here's the free radical, bam, glutathione peroxidase converts it back to water, but we had this re reduced glutathione donate over here to this selenium-dependent glutathione peroxidase, and then now we have an oxidized glutathione because it took it, but hold on a minute, glutathione reductase, recycles the glutathione so that it can begin to provide the other molecules necessary to create the reduction once again. A very amazing system. So let's dive a little bit even deeper into 
just our normal mitochondrial endogenous reactive oxygen species production. So when we look at this thing, we can see how superoxide is generated by the respiratory chain at two levels, complex one and complex three. And I'll note those right there and right there. Superoxide would be this yellow star looking item here. Now, given the spatial location of these complexes, these superoxide anions produced by complex one are mostly released into the mitochondrial matrix. You see those reduction right down here. While the superoxide anions produced in complex three are released in the inner membrane space. You see this right here, IMS, intermembrane space. So this superoxide here and here can naturally dismute to hydrogen peroxide or even it's enzymatically disputed by this matrix manganese dependent superoxide dismutase or the copper zinc dependent superoxide dismutase in the intermembrane space or the cytosol. So you can see copper zinc make this one go and this one go and manganese makes this SOD go. So now we can see how important these particular enzymes are and there we see catalase as well as we discussed earlier taking the hydrogen peroxide which was created by the conversion here to make water and oxygen and we can see clearly that there's glutathione peroxidase over there working to convert this H2O2 to H2O. Very complex process but the point being this is a normal process for us in our bodies therefore looking at the enzyme function and at the cofactors, not one, but both, it's critical to optimizing function. So now we can understand why knowing the SNPs or the single nucleotide polymorphisms, meaning are these enzymes, SOD, catalase, glutathione peroxidase, working fast, working slow, and then we have to look at these cofactors. So there are three side enzymes, side one, side two, and side three. Side one is cytosolic and it's dependent upon copper and zinc. Side two is mitochondrial and it's manganese dependent. Side three is extracellular and again, it's copper and zinc dependent. Glutathione peroxidase is selenium dependent as we saw in a previous slide. And catalase is dependent upon iron. Enos, is dependent upon tetrahydrobaropterin, which is a methylation factor for choline, arginine, and citrulline. Well, where can we get some of these things just from our natural food sources? Copper is in beef liver, sunflower seeds, and lentils. Zinc is in kidney beans, beef, and flaxseed. Manganese is in your leafy greens, your fruit, and your shellfish. Selenium, of course, we know is in our famous Brazil nuts. And iron is in our dark green veggies and red meat. And nitric oxide precursors are in melons and beets. Very important to keep this slide handy when you're talking about clear interventions, whether with food and or supplements to upregulate these things, especially when you have a variant that is low function. Now, ENOS or endothelial nitric oxide synthase enzyme it's gonna catalyze or uncouple nitric oxide. It's gonna play a key role in the regulation of vascular tone and of course, peripheral resistance. It has vasoprotective effects by suppressing what we know as platelet aggregation, leukocyte adhesion, and smooth muscle cell proliferation. So of course, we're talking vasoprotection. Now in this particular enzyme, the T allele, it has an impact in a negative direction towards cardiovascular disease because we're going to get less nitric oxide production, therefore less vasodilatory effects. So we're going to have with the TLL more potential, and I use the word potential, risk of atherosclerosis, essential hypertension, end-stage renal disease, and even preeclampsia. Now the G, it's the wild type. So it's working well with no impact. So now we can see clearly 
that if a person's a TMT allele high impact, this is one where maybe the beets and the melons become more critical. We've got to get it working well. And if you're wondering how you check this in the blood, you can check a marker called ADMA. Again, that's ADMA, asymmetric dimethyl arginine, which will give you from a vascular capacity nitric oxide availability. So when ADMA goes up, nitric oxide availability goes down. Now, we look at superoxide dismutase. Dr. Michelle talked about this with the copper and the zinc within SOD1 and 3, but what about SOD2? Remember, this was right down there in the matrix of the mitochondria. This guy destroys free radicals that are normally produced within the cells. We saw that. Remember, the superoxide was converted to hydrogen peroxide by SOD2. Wild type, this has an impact. What does that mean? That means that the wild type is less functional, but more common. Again, I'm gonna say that one more time, less functional, but more common. So do you think manganese might be important? Do you think putting extra emphasis on zinc um, and copper might be important as well? It's a big deal because with the C allele, we need to increase dietary intake of vegetables and fruit to ensure, guess what? More antioxidant intake from food because your body's ability to dismantle these oxidants might be lower. So we're gonna to have to ensure adequate intake, uh, intake of manganese, which again is a cofactor for SOD2. Now, people wanna know how to do that. Uh, typically, we use SOD granules, and I'll, I'll say this on here because I want people to have tools. Um, there's a, a product called um, Dismuzyme Granules, and I believe the company is Biotics, and that one has SOD and catalase in it from plants and works quite well. So if a person has SOD and catalase variables, certainly it makes sense to increase the vegetables and fruits and also perhaps the granules. So now, by now you can see that the superoxide free radical is highly toxic and it is considered to be a major contributor to aging as it damages cells. As it's biologically toxic, it is deployed by the immune system to kill invading microorganisms. The superoxide damage contributes to the etiology of many of our chronic health problems, such as cardiovascular disease, inflammatory diseases, cataracts and even cancer. It is capable of damaging DNA, proteins, and lipids. So this section should be addressed first. We really want to squelch this free radical before we even focus on methylation. So glutathione peroxidase is the most abundant of the selenium peroxidases and one of the most impendent, uh, important selenium-dependent antioxidant enzymes. It's ubiquitously expressed in almost all tissues in the body and is responsible for catalyzing the conversion of hydrogen peroxide into water, as we saw in the graphs. You can see the wild type has no impact, the CC. The CT has a moderate impact, and the TT is high impact meaning that the T allele leads to decreased enzyme function and it has been linked to disturbed antioxidative balance. T allele carriers are associated with increased risk for chronic disease, including certain cancers and coronary artery disease, especially in the presence of a low fruit and vegetable diet, a person that is sedentary because sitting is the new smoking, somebody who smokes, and has a high alcohol consumption. So the recommendation, of course, for the T allele is to change their nutritional protocol with a polyphenol-rich diet, high intake of vegetables, add in those Brazil nuts and other food sources that are rich in selenium because glutathione peroxidase is selenium dependent. You may even add in some sardines and some turkey. If their nutrition is poor and you can't get it in them with food, you may want to resort to supplementation. 
look at catalase, which is the last enzyme in the panel, and clearly uh, we saw its uh, great responsibility in converting the hydrogen peroxide to water and oxygen. Tyler expressed in the liver, kidney, and the red blood cells. As we saw, this is critical to the redox process. Decreased catalase activity is associated with, again, it just makes sense, cancer, diabetes, neurodegenerative diseases. Um, it is important to understand that in this particular one, the TT, which is the wild type, it has a moderate impact. That means the wild type is the one that's least functional. If you get a CC in this one from the, the SNPs, that means it's going to be beneficial or upregulated. So what are you going to do with TT? Again, increase vegetable intake. Very, very important. And as an FYI, TT is also associated with um, women with breast cancer. So very important to really get into this. Catalase is key to optimization. So just a reminder, catalase is critical to health and it's found in nearly every living organism on the planet that is exposed to oxygen. It has one of the highest rates of turnover when compared to all the other enzymes. In other words, one catalase enzyme can change 40 million molecules of hydrogen peroxide into water and oxygen in just one second. So just thinking about how if catalase is deficient, how those negative end products can add up significantly and destroy DNA and cellular processing. So let's look at it one more time, just so we can make sure we get it. There's superoxide that gets created naturally. Now, if we have a bunch of inducers, that increases it. We saw that. And if we get dysfunctional SOD, catalase, or GPX1, we're going to see buildup of both hydroxyl radical and peroxy nitrate. Now you can, you can get dissolvable hydrogen caps, dissolve in water, and you can drink hydrogen water and it will actually break the hydroxyl radical down to H2O. But as you can see, when you have a lot of this peroxy nitrate and these other free radicals, which will tie into methylation next, heart disease, there's lipid peroxidation right there. That's what Dr. Michelle was talking about earlier. Now let's look and tie this thing into methylation because I think this is big. This is a large methylation map. Lots of confusing stuff here. Or really is it? So let's start out over here at nitric oxide synthase. And here we can see how lead might shut that down. So heavy metals, of course they're important. Now if this thing becomes uncoupled here, as we talked about, and you get nitric oxide, combined with superoxide down here, you get this peroxy nitrate superoxide matrix, which will damage the brain and create this oxidative stress process. Now, if you have enough glutathione, it will absolutely deal with this peroxide or peroxy nitrite and the superoxide. If we get peroxy nitrite controlled, we're fine. But what about that other one, hydroxyl radical? Remember we saw that back here, what does it do with the methylation pathway? Well, we have to go further and right up here, the methionine to SAMe conversion through this enzyme right here. Hydroxyl radical will block that, stop, going no further. So we will get methionine back up or even homocysteine back up. And this is how you would check that perhaps, or looking at a full panel. But hydroxyl radical will block this. Therefore, you won't get the Universal methadone or SAM E created. So the buildup of free radicals, if not dealt with, will completely impair this whole methylation process. So now let's dive into methylation. So if we address the free radicals, what are we going to address with methylation? Here we go. Yes, so now that we've discussed oxidative stress impact on methylation, methylation uses the process of donating methyl, donating methyl groups to a substrate. A methyl group consists of one carbon bound to three hydrogen atoms. Methyl group substrates include your neurotransmitters, DNA and RNA, the process aid genetic expression, and the repair of DNA and RNA. So methylation serves functions such as the modulation of the fight or flight or stress response. 
It's involved in the production and recycling of glutathione, the body's master antioxidant. It's important in the detoxification of hormones, so you'll see it also in the estrogen section. It's important in chemicals and heavy metal detox. Methylation aids in the inflammation response by dampening the internal fires of life by aiding cellular repair that are damaged by free radicals. We saw that earlier, didn't we? We saw where correct response from the oxidation pathway or the oxidative stress pathway leads to the ability of methylation to repair DNA. But if we have a hyper amount of oxidation, it could lend itself to hypo or low methylation by using up all the methyl groups. A quick test for methylation status, this is very interesting. You can give an individual 50 milligrams of nicotinic acid on an empty stomach. If they flush, they likely have low methylation and high histamine. Giving them 100 milligrams of nicotinic acid on an empty stomach, if they flush, they likely have balanced methylation and histamine as well. Give them 150 milligrams of nicotinic acid and no flush, they're likely an overmethylator. Interestingly, if niacin is taken daily, the high histamine will usually be depleted and in some instances, stop the flushing. So make sure if you do this test in your office, it's a quick, down and dirty, cheap, easy thing to do, warn them about what a flush is don't let them just experience it thinking it's funny to watch them because if you've experienced the niacin flush or the nicotinic acid flush you know what i'm talking about it can alarm you if it's severe in its um in its escalation again no big deal but make sure you tell them about it first now what about over and under methylation we get asked about that all the time it's it's really related to the, the, the production of those methyl groups. So between the SAMe and the acidinocyl homocysteine cycle. So it, it's a concentration of methyl that determines if you're under methylated or over methylated. So it's the overall activity of the enzyme cycle pathways that determines your methyl concentration status. It is not, and I repeat not, the activity of one single enzyme. So we're gonna go through this pathway over and over again through our, our, our last several minutes as we wrap the, the methylation section because I wanna really make sure we get this. Repetition is the king to deep memory or deep recall. So under methylation is probably the most common. Remember how oxidative stress overload can contribute to this. Histamine overload also pushes down the concentration of methyl. We can also have protein deficiency or malabsorption. And remember the ammonia overload and how its effect is on the uric acid cycle. When you talk about histamine overload, think about leaky gut, gut dysfunction. And that's gonna contribute, of course, to protein deficiency or malabsorption. So this is a domino effect that can occur and so really start connecting all these things together. Uh, Overmethylation can also occur. It's the least common, but in individuals where they have panic and anxiety and ADHD and behavioral disorders, depression, paranoid schizophrenia, and just things that uh, you're not able to get on top of without diving deeper into their genetics and their methylation status. So hint, hint, clue, clue on this one. If you see some SNPs on a genetic panel that give you indication that you have some of the methylation SNPs that are maybe under potentially performing, don't just treat the SNPs because they could be performing well because they have adequate cofactors. Remember we talked about earlier. In this case, if you gave them substances that could lend itself to more methyl group production possibly could lead to some anxiety so let's look at the methylation cycle in action and we're going to tie this back together with the big picture in just a moment this one carbon metabolism regulates the transfer of these methyl groups 
into biological methylation reactions. So we can see right here that methionine is converted to SAMe. SAMe is your universal methyl donor, which is given over here to methylate DNA and histone. So we're talking about repair. Once this is given away, it goes back to the recycle process. There's S-adenosyl homocysteine. It lost its methyl group, and that becomes homocysteine. Homocysteine is supposed to be reconverted back to methionine in two different ways. This way to the left is the folate independent pathway. So choline makes betaine, and we use this to help the conversion of homocysteine to methionine. This is going to occur in the liver, absent of folate. We look over here, this is dependent upon folate where 5,10-methylene tetrahydrofolate is converted by an enzyme, which we'll talk about in just a minute, the infamous, I'll say MTHFR, to 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, where we donate the methyl group with the help of B12 and this methionine synthase, which we'll talk about in a minute, to get the homocysteine remethylated again to make methionine. Very fascinating process. And of course, down here, we're gonna talk about this in a moment, homocysteine through the help of this enzyme, which is called cystothionine beta synthase, is eventually converted into glutathione, which we saw how important that was a moment ago to dealing with these free radicals. So let's take a little bit larger, we step out a little bit. Take note of all the energy that's required for these reactions. Think about malnourished population. Here's ATP. If we're not getting enough energy created from our bodies, we gotta think about gut dysfunction. So you can see all this stuff is dependent upon each other. Here's our methionine cycle once again. Here is the folate independent side of this conversion. Here is the folate dependent side of this conversion, but we're trying to get this homocysteine to be remethylated into methionine so that we can get the SAMe created. Obviously, there's a lot going on here, and we're gonna step out one more time to our big methylation chart, and then we're gonna go into these enzymes again. One more time, we're gonna look at MTHFR, we're gonna look at MTR and MTRR right here, we're gonna look at CBS, and we're also gonna look at COMT. We've talked about the, and here's Dr. Michelle mentioned over here, when we don't get protein breakdown okay and we get ammonia buildup, look what it does. It comes all the way over here and it interferes with the uric acid cycle here, which will pull away, believe it or not. Tetrahydrobiotin will jump over here to help out. We won't get conversion of tryptophan to serotonin and tyrosine to dopamine. And if we don't, if we have ammonia buildup like this, it's impairing up here, we could be depressed, right? So would giving methyl groups help? Not really. Fixing the gut might help. Looking at oxidative stress might help. And remember we talked about peroxynitrites, incredible dysfunction creation ability. And we talked about hydroxyl radical inhibiting us up here. So this pathway is one that you might want to laminate, keep in your office. I'm not saying you show this to your patients, but it's a good refresher to go explain the inter- relationship between all these different cycles that we see here. And there are five again listed up to your top left. So here is a list of the enzymes in the methylation section of the report. Be thinking what you would do for this patient if you saw the above profile. Remember that methyl groups are used for making creatine and energy disorders may really get help with looking at where the energy crisis may be. Evaluation of the depths of methylation, transsulfuration, and the organic acids with an organic acids test may get down to where the function may be abnormal and where we need to give the system support. This first enzyme, MTHFD1. Encodes for a protein that has three different enzymatic activities, 5,10-methyl-tetrahydrofolate dehydrogenase, cyclohydrolase, and formal tetrahydrofolate synthetase. These 
are enzymatic reactions in the interconversion of one carbon derivatives of tetrahydrofolate, which are substrates for methiamine, thymylate, and de novo purine synthesis. In this SNP, 510-methyl tetrahydrofolate dehydrogenase, the A allele is associated with decreased enzyme activity, leading to an increased dependence or load on the folate independent methylation pathway. The A allele also leads to increased dependence on dietary choline for phosphatidylcholine production at the expense of betaine synthesis. The A allele carriers have been linked to signs of choline deficiency, organ, liver, and muscle dysfunction, as well as an increased risk for neural tube defects and endometriosis. So let's look at this in pathway format. Right here you see MTHFD1, 1, 2, 3. And it just makes sense. If it's not working properly, we're not going to get good folate conversion all the way through to get tetrahydrofolate converted to methylene tetrahydrofolate. So this is going to be blocked. That is why we are more dependent upon the folate independent pathway of getting this idea of methionine to go back around. To homocysteine. So this is why the in, inducement of this enzyme or the less function, we've got to think about adding choline to here, or at least maybe adding 510-methylene meth tetrahydrofolate right here as well. So always think about the big picture when we're going through these particular SNPs. So now we're going to jump in from MTH of D1 to probably one of the most confused ones, at least we see, in our world today. Here it is. MTHFR, methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase, is a flavoprotein which is riboflavin dependent that catalyzes the NADPH dependent reduction of 510 methylene tetrahydrofolate to 5 methyl tetrahydrofolate, which is an essential folate cofactor for the remethylation of homocysteine to methionine. The MTHFR reaction is irreversible and thereby commits folate cofactors to homocysteine remethylation pathway. MTHFR activity is inhibited by SAM, providing feedback inhibition and limiting SAM synthesis and accumulation. We look at this in two positions, which we'll discuss in just a moment. And alterations in the MTHFR enzyme activity equals high homocysteine levels, increasing risk for atherosclerosis, decrease in DNA methylation, which can lend to an increase in DNA damage or addicts, which is short for saying end result could be cancer. Bad deal. So the two positions, 677, we'll start with 677. The C is the wild type, CC wild type with no impact. The CT is heterozygote with a moderate impact and the TT homozygote has a high impact. The T allele reduces the stability and lowers the activity of the MTHFR enzyme, which results in an increase in homocysteine levels, a decrease in DNA methylation, thus an increase in DNA adduct or damage. The T allele, carrier, the T allele carriers have increased folate, vitamin B2, vitamin B6, and vitamin B12 requirements. Enzyme function is only about 70% optimal in the CT individuals and 30 to 40% optimal in the TT individuals. So recommendations for the T alleles is to incorporate a folate and B vitamin rich nutritional protocol and get rid of the pollution and the things that drain B vitamins such as alcohol, smoking, and a poor nutritional protocol. The 1298, if we look at the 1298, the AA is the wild type with no impact, the heterozygote AC mild impact, and the CC has a moderate impact. The C allele affects the enzyme regulation by SAM and is associated with decreased enzyme function. The recommendations for the C allele are exactly like they are for the T allele in the 677. And here they are in action. 
I think it's very important to kind of see these things work. There's MTHFR right over there, and it's B2 or riboflavin dependent. So again, think through the process, even if this one is down-regulated, like Dr. Michelle talked about, and we've got enough B2, it could be working. Or even on the other side, it could be fully functional, but we don't have B2, it might not be working. But as you can see, it's important to have this enzyme working so that 510-methyl tetrahydrofolate can be converted into 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. And then that has helped to donate, once again, with B12 over here, to help homocysteine get back around to methionine to create more methyl groups. Pretty awesome process, I must say. Methionine synthase. This enzyme remethylates methionine. You want to make sure that these individuals do not have a deficiency in glutathione. This reaction is B12 dependent, and activity is essential to supply methionine for SAM synthesis and to prevent accumulation of homocysteine and S adenosyl homocysteine. So there is a common polymorphism which affects the functional site of the protein and hence the levels of circulating folate and homocysteine. The wild type AA has no impact. When you bring in that G allele, you have upregulation. The homozygote is actually beneficial. So the GG, the G allele, is going to be associated with decreased levels of homocysteine. So curiously, I hope everybody caught that. In this case, the variation of this from the A to G type change is going to be beneficial. So it makes it work faster. So if you have a G allele in this, would you want to necessarily give B12? Maybe not. So you want to think about that. And here it is in action. You can see right there, you would see B12. This is methionine synthate using B12. If this guy's upregulated, the cool thing is, it's going to be using B12 very efficiently, but we could be B12 deficient on the other hand. If we have bad gut dysfunction or we're taking uh, proton pump inhibitors, there you go. Think about that. Not making B12 efficiently. And if we don't do that, then even if methionine synthase is upregulated, it's still not going to work. So again, one more time, think through the big picture. Methionine synthase reductase is involved in the reductive regeneration of cobalamin, which is vitamin B12, a cofactor required for the maintenance of methionine synthase in a functional state. So over time, the cobalamin cofactor of methionine synthase becomes oxidized, rendering the MTR enzyme inactive. So regeneration of functional enzymes requires reductive methylation via a reaction that is catalyzed by MTRR in which SAM is used as the methyl donor. The G allele is associated with increased risk for premature coronary artery disease. It's a significant risk factor for the development of neural tube defects when vitamin B status is low. We transition into cystathionine beta synthase. Remember, this was at the bottom of the methylation cycle here. Now, it's important that homocysteine is, is made into methionine through this look with the help of folic acid. And here's where MTHF D1 would occur. There's MTHFR right there. And here is this methionine synthase with methionine synthase reductase hanging closely by. But homocysteine is important. If we have this thing going so fast that this goes down, watch this. CBS, cystothionine beta synthase, can't grab that to make cystothionine and therefore on to make glutathione. So balance is the key. If you're checking labs, homocysteine should be somewhere between about seven to eight in that area and you're going to be safe. With this CBS enzyme, the CC or the wild type has no impact. But if you transition to the C to the T, from C to T or T to T, it's going to have benefit. That means this one works faster. So if you have a T, it's going to pull off homocysteine faster to make glutathione. However, if homocysteine is too low, it can't swing back around here to make methionine to make your methyl groups. 
All right, so very important to look, once again, it's like a broken record, but I want you to get this record right. Look at the big picture. Catechol or methyl transferase, C-O-M-T. It controls the levels of certain hormones and catecholamines and adds a methyl group to them and inactivates them. If you have poor functioning COMPT, this means that you may be slow at clearing dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine. This puts an individual at risk for disorders of impulse control and in the process of the limbic center with emotion. Excessive dopamine can amplify negative emotions on the limbic system. This is where the big antipsychotics block dopamine. So if colomethyl transferase does not work properly, the adrenaline neurotransmitters will hang around a long time. If you're homozygote for this enzyme, it may be functioning at a fourth or fifth of what is normal. Colomethyl transferase is highly magnesium dependent. Sometimes giving an individual a little SAMe may also help, help COMPT. Alcohol and caffeine can inhibit COMPT. And you want to be careful with giving an individual that is low-functioning comp, quercetin, which is a potent bioflavonoid and is often used for its antihistamine properties. You want to be careful not to suppress comp with high doses. The catechins in green tea can also suppress comp if taken in high doses. A couple of methylation uh, takeaways, if you will. Again, look at the big picture. We've got to look at oxidative stress, ladies and gentlemen, because that is going to impair all methylation. We've discussed that enough. We've tried to lay a case out here for you that made that very clear. Listen to the patient, that's important. And when we're talking about methylation, we've got to make our cofactors work B2, B6, B12, and magnesium. But what about nucleotides, the building blocks of of our, of our cells, of our proteins, of our DNA. Big deal. We think nucleotides should be in the staple of everybody's from a prophylactic standpoint, giving your body material to work. So if you produce methyl groups, but you can't get enough nucleotides, how do you fix anything? So now you can see how all of this sort of ties together um, as we go forward. A couple of things when you're looking at a few more takeaways with methylation, we've given you the down and dirty determinant of methylation status by using niacin. You can look at a methylation panel. We find that very beneficial if we see a persistent elevated homocysteine that we just can't figure out. You can find out where the, the roadblock is. Um, high risk groups, if you will, are those that smoke and those that drink a lot. And, uh, family history of cancers and cardiovascular disease, of course. Uh, just pay attention to some people's um, medications too. As I stated, proton pump inhibitors, statins, metformin are, are going to pull out such things such as folate and B12. If you're interested in what drugs pull out uh, different nutrients or what nutrients are pulled out with drugs, a website you can look at is mytavin, M-Y-T-A-V-I-N.com. Again, that's M-Y-T-A-V-I-N. T-A-V-I-N.com. Uh, bookmark that, use a lot, put in the medication uh, milieu that your patient is using, and you'll see how it, the medications are pulling out things that will impair the methylation pathway and even your oxidative stress pathways as well. So all natural tips to improve methylation pathways. Number one, eat healthy greens. Eating dark leafy green veggies daily will provide you with natural folate, a methyl donor, which is necessary for proper methylation. Make sure to get a minimum of two cups of these healing foods daily. You may need to supplement with B vitamins and folate if you can't get it nutritionally. B vitamins, remember, are the methyl donors, especially folate, B6, B12, and riboflavin. Take a probiotic. Remember, the good bugs in your GI tract help produce and absorb B vitamins and folate. Reduce the toxic load, reduce stress, reduce booze, smoking, and other toxins. Remember, these toxic splinters burden your liver and they use up methyl groups. So if that's the case, we want to make sure that we have optimal glutathione to spare those methyl groups. 
So a few ways that you can improve glutathione is eating healthy proteins. You may take a protein powder if you uh, don't care for some of the protein rich foods. Eat sulfurous foods as well. Sulfur is a key component of glutathione, so eating enough sulfur containing foods is vital. Sources of sulfur foods are garlic, onions, cruciferous vegetables like kale, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, watercress, and even bok choy. Optimize your antioxidants. Things like vitamin C, D, E, they all encourage glutathione levels and selenium. Move your body. Besides reducing stress and depression, exercise also boosts glutathione levels and improves detoxification. Studies show that lack of sleep can deplete glutathione, so make sure we're getting adequate sleep each night. Then spice it up. You can use your spices to improve glutathione levels in the liver, like curcumin. It's also an anti-inflammatory. The biggest thing is the solution to pollution is dilution. Stop the incoming offending agents. So there you go. There's our contact information. Um, this has been a pleasure. Uh, we wanted to give you a taste of how nutrigenetic, nutrigenomic information can help and how two specific pathways, oxidative stress and methylation are ultra critical to understanding in an intimate way so that we can get our persons and patients better across this world. So it's been a pleasure. I'm gonna stop sharing right now, bring back our video so we can give you a hello and, and a virtual hug again. Thank you so much for um, listening to us today. Before you run away, we have some questions. <laughs> Got it, we're ready. And I think everybody out there wants, um, if you can, repeat the niacin provocation uh, clinical test with the first the 50 milligrams and if there was 50 milligrams on an empty stomach with flush then what <laughs> all right sweetheart i'll let you do that one but i like the word provocation because that's really what it is you are going to provoke them i'll tell you right now but it just again warn them about how you're going to provoke them go ahead <laughs> yeah that, that flush sometimes feels like you got the hives so it's 50 milligrams of nicotinic acid on an empty stomach. If they flush, they're likely a low methylator with high histamine. If you give them 100 milligrams of nicotinic acid on an empty stomach, if they slightly flush, they likely have balanced methylation and histamine. If you give them 150 milligrams of nicotinic acid and no flush, they're likely an over methylator. And if you increase that niacin um, daily, the high histamine is usually depleted. And so in some instances, we'll actually stop the flushing. So just to uh, highlight what flush is, uh, the flush as a response to niacin is like getting, you get red in the, mm -hmm. in the skin. Um, it's very clear on like the throat and in the face, but it can occur on the whole body. It's like, a, it's like an allergic response because histamine is, is involved. Mm -hmm. So, um, if people really can't tolerate it and, and you like provoke too much, would you give like an antihistamine just to calm it down or do you just ask people to wait out? Because this can last like the whole day. Yeah. yeah, it can be very uncomfortable and individuals who have a really strong response and want to get through it will use an antihistamine until yeah. it settles out. No. You can give them a little quercetin if you wanted to and that would tone it down pretty quickly. So the website that you mentioned is called Mitavin as in vitamin but it's mitavin and you can type in uh the the, the drugs and, and vitamins and see if uh, there is any um yeah challenges with that mm -hmm. combination it's not it's a neat website uh yeah. to have logged into the website point of so, note on that too there are there are references that are provided there if people are wanting to go deeper so it's not just pulling it out and showing you what it, it'll show you the references from the studies that, that determine that so um, just again, back to the niacin, because other questions are coming up of like, so the, the, the thing is that if people eat it with food, it, uh, it, it, it's, it slows down the absorption.
function maybe of the of the uh, niacin so then the response might be more weak so you can't really use the the provocation test and interpret it the same way and then of course if you flush on 70 milligrams and it goes away after 15 minutes are you under methylated and so on i, I this is this is your experience in the clinic i, I mean any references and so on on this is, is also questions coming coming up. Well, it's really kind of the poor man's cheat test. Yeah. The best way to really determine it is, of course, to go to a methylation panel. And if we do this, we usually do it first thing in the morning on an empty stomach. So as you set it up, it's always done the same. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So uh, remember, it's a little bit like with betaine HCL. You you can when does it start burning, and does it exactly mean that yeah. you're yeah. lacking stomach acid? It's an indication. It's a it's a it's a clinical tool. It's it gives us a, like empirical uh, knowledge ab about the patient. So um, exactly. um, yeah. yeah. So uh, someone is asking about the webinar. Yeah, if this is a, 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 a something we had a biohacker event. I just have it because it says DNA Life and Mark Hyman yeah. is endorsing yeah. our tests and he, he loves it and uses it in, in, mm -hmm. in his clinics and so on. So, but we will send you a link uh, on the post record when we send out the email after this uh, webinar with the recording, the slides and a link to where you can read more about our DNA Life certification course where uh, Michelle and Mark are, are, are teaching as well. Um, so you will get all this information again. So look out for your emails and it will go out probably tomorrow. Um, I hope, uh, let's see, well, sometimes the recording takes a little longer. We'll see, but we will send it as soon as possible. And the first, uh, uh course, uh, the next certification course is 11 to 13th of uh, September. And we really hope to see you then because this is yeah. amazing. Of course, those in Singapore and Jakarta and so on, that would be in the middle of your night because it's, it's your time zone in, the, in Oklahoma. Uh, those in Europe can join in, and, but then you just sit in the evening. I think we start around five or seven o'clock and then go on for some hours or three days. Um, but we will plan to see if we can get you two guys to get up a little bit earlier so that it fits better with, <laughs> with your European time zones, zones and so that those in, um, in, in, in Far East can uh, join a little earlier in their uh, evening as well. So um, if you can review the SAH in the methylation pathway, I think we will send the recording you can yeah. read it listen to it again stop uh, go through it again again if you want even more sign up for the uh, course and remember when you sign up for the course you get to do all the six uh, nutrigenomic dna tests that mm -hmm. dna life is offering the health uh which is look covering many different uh, health areas. There is the mind, which is looking at genes in relation to, to uh, cognitive function, uh, mood and um, uh, addictions. Mm -hmm. And then there's diet for weight management. Uh, there is estrogen in regards to estrogen metabolism, breast cancer. Um, then there is one for skin. And what am I missing out? I'm missing out sport, the one for the athletes or the uh, excited athlete who wants to um, upskill themselves and so on. And you can see Mark and Michelle there uh, also doing what they preach uh, in different ways, but they are very, very fit and they're using nucleotides themselves, of course. And if you join the, the course, you will get their little anecdote on the use of nucleotides and, and training and exercise. Um, and you will get a lot of insight into the different genetic uh, tests. So. I think with this, um, I'm going to thank you so much. No, no, <laughs> for our doing pleasure. This. We love it. I know it was fast and furious, but uh, it's good information. And, and, and this is just a, a little bit of an indication of what can be possible with people. So it, it's, it's a necessary thing, we believe. Yeah. It's fast and furious, but we also have practitioners out there who really want that. And yeah. a lot of us, including myself, we are very, very hungry. Um, so this was the appetite, waking up the appetite for the course or a date, as I said. <laughs> for sure. So everybody around the world, thank you very much for joining us. I have missed you. Uh, it has been my summer holiday. I've been camping, as I said last time. 
but now we are back and we are back again in two weeks time for a fasting mimicking diet a webinar as well and there is more to come so thank you very much for today we will be in touch virtual hug, <laughs> virtual, hug. <laughs> virtual hug all right bye bye, -bye.